from around the globe, it's theCUBE. With digital coverage of Ansible Fest 2020. Brought to you by Red Hat. Hello everyone, welcome back to theCUBE's virtual coverage of Ansible Fest 2020. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE. We're here virtual, we're not face to face, obviously because of COVID. So we're doing a virtual event, Ansible Fest coverage. We're at Mary Johnston Turner, Research Vice President of Cloud Management at IDC, International Data Corp. Mary, great to see you. Thanks for coming on for Ansible Fest 2020. Thanks for inviting me. So obviously cloud management, everything's cloud native now. We're seeing that at VMworld. Uh, we got reInvent coming up, Azure's got growth. Um, the enterprises have gotten some religion on cloud native. Uh, COVID certainly is forcing that. What are you seeing uh, from your research at IDC around the convergence of clouds, uh, uh, cloud strategies? What, what's the data tell you? What's the research show? Well, uh, you know, obviously with, with, with COVID, a lot of folks have pivoted or accelerated their move to the cloud uh, in many ways. And I think what, what's happening is that we're, we're seeing many, many organizations recognizing they continue to have need for on-prem resources. They're building out edge. They've got remote work from home. They've got traditional VM workloads. They've got, um, you know, modern cloud uh, native, uh, container-based workloads running on-prem and in public clouds and public cloud services. So it's really um, kind of a striking uh, world of connected clouds is how I'm talking about it increasingly. And I think what that means from an operational perspective is that it's getting more and more challenging for organizations to maintain consistent configurations, stable APIs, uh, security, compliance and conformance. And they're really starting to look at automation as the way to uh, deal with the increasing scale and velocity of change, because that's one of the things that's happening. And I think COVID accelerated it is uh, we've seen organizations stand up applications they never thought they were going to have to stand up. And they not only stood them up very quickly, but then they continue to update them with great frequency, often you know, multiple times a day or a week. Uh, and, and the infrastructure has had to pivot and the workloads have had to migrate. So it's really been a, a very challenging time for many organizations. And I think those that are coping the best with it are the ones who have been investing in, in automation, particularly um, automation in, in a you know, CICD pipeline and code based environment. Yeah, you know, you're seeing the releases, obviously automation has helped on the agile side, um, VMs and containers. Um, have been a great way to automate. Um, how are customers looking at this? Because it seems to be automation is like the first step towards everything as a service, right? So it's, you know, XAAS as it, as it says, as it's called in the industry, services is ultimately the holy grail in all this because you get when the automation and services, you know, it used to be automation, automation, automation. And now you're hearing as a service, as a service, as a service is the top three priority. So it seems to be a trajectory. How are customers um, getting, first of all, do you agree with that? And then our, how do customers think about this? Because sometimes, you know, we're ahead of the, the customers. Automation is the first step. What's your take on this? And what are customers planning when it comes to automation? Are they thinking as a service? What are you, what are you hearing from well, your customers? Let's talk a little bit about what we mean by as a service, because that's a really interesting concept, right? And I, I, I've been having this conversation with folks. As a service started, you know, what, a decade or more ago, taking things that, particularly software that ran on-prem, infrastructure or software, and putting it into shared data centers where we could run multi-tenant environments, we could scale it. And, and each cloud provider basically got that scale by investing in their own set of infrastructure automations. So whether it was Azure or VMware or whoever, they, uh, you know, they, they, they build a whole uh, repeatable, scalable environment that they could control. What's happening now is that we're seeing these control planes get stretched back to on-prem resources. And I think what's really happening is, is that the line about, well, where does the thing physically have to run becomes more of a discussion around the physics of the matter, you know, latency data volumes, transaction processing, cost of installed uh, equipment. And every organization is making its own choice about what's the right mix in terms of where physically do things have to run uh, and how they want to manage them. But I think that we're starting to see an abstraction layer coming in between that. And a lot of that abstraction is automation that's 
portable that can be applied across these environments um, and that can be used to standardize configurations, to maintain standard APIs, to uh, deploy at very uh, fast speed and consistency across all these different resources. And so, you know, automation is, and, and the related management layer to me is that new abstraction layer that, that actually is going to allow most enterprises to stop worrying quite so much about, you know, what kind of as a service am I buying yeah. and focus more on, you know, the economics and the, the, the performance and the physics of, of the infrastructure and then maintain consistency uh, with highly automated, repeatable, um, you know, programmable style environments that, that are consistent across all these different platforms. Yeah, that's a great point, it's great insight. I, I love that. It's almost as you can almost visualize the boardroom. We need to change our business model as, as a service. Go do it, climb that hill, get it done. Like, what are you talking about? We're just trying to manage workloads inside our enterprise and outside uh, as they start looking at the workload aspect of it. It's not trivial to just say it, right? So, I, and, and you know, containers has barely filled the void here. Um, how are customers and how are people getting started started with this initial building block of saying, okay, do we just containerize it? Because that's another hand-waving activity, which has a lot of traction. Obviously you put some containers, it's got some goodness to it. Um, are many people getting started with um, solving this problem? And what are some of the roadblocks of just managing these workloads inside and outside the enterprise? Well, again, I think, uh, yeah, many organizations are still in the early uh, stages of working with containers. Uh, you know, right now, I think our research shows that maybe five to 10% of, of applications have been containerized. And, and that's a mix of lift and shift of traditional uh, workloads, as well as net new cloud native. Uh, over the next couple of years, though, most enterprises tell us they think a third of their uh, workloads could be containerized. So it's ramping very, very quickly. Uh, again, I think that the, the goal for many organizations is, is certainly containers uh, allow for faster development, better support of microservices, but increasingly it's also about portability. I talked to many organizations that say, yeah, one of the reasons I'm moving even traditional workloads into containers is so that I have that flexibility. And again, they're trying to get away from the, the uh, tight coupling of workloads to physical resources and saying, you know, I'm going to make those, those choices, but they might change over time, or I might need to, to, you know, COVID happens, I have to scale much faster than I ever thought. Uh, I'm never going to be able to do that in my own data center. I'm going to go to the cloud. Uh, so I think that we're, we're seeing uh, increasing investments in, in uh, Kubernetes and containers uh, to promote more rapid scaling and increased business agility. And again, I think that means that organizations are looking for uh, those workloads to run across a whole set of environments, geographies, physical locations, edge. Uh, and so they're, they're investing in, in platforms and again, automation to help them do that. So your, so your point uh, here is that you know, five, 10%, that's a lot of growth opportunity. So containers is actually happening now. So you know, you're starting to see that progression. So that's, that's great insight. So I got to ask you on the COVID impact, um, that certainly changed some some orientation because hey, this project let's double down on this, this is a tailwind for us. Work from home, this new environment, and and these projects maybe we want to wait on those. How do we come out of COVID? Um, some people have been saying some spending in some areas are increasing, some are not. How are customers spending money on it, uh, infrastructure with COVID impact? What are you seeing from the numbers? Well, that's a great question. You know, in IDC, what, one of the major things we do is track uh, IT markets and spending and, and purchasing around the world. And as you might expect, if you go back to the early part of the year, uh, there was a very rapid uh, shift to cloud, uh, particularly uh, to support work from home. And obviously there was a lot of investment in, um, you know, virtual desktops and remote work kinds of and collaboration uh, very early on. But now that we're sort of maturing a little bit and, and moving into, um, you know, more of a, you know, ongoing recovery resiliency sort of phase, uh, we continue to see very strong spending on cloud. Uh, I think overall it's accelerated this move to more connected environments. Uh, many of the new initiatives are, are being built and deployed uh, in cloud environments. And, and but again, we're we're not seeing a whole whole hog, um, you know, exit from on-prem resources. Um, the other thing is is edge. Uh, we're seeing a, a lot of growth on edge. Both again, there's sort of work from home, but also uh, 
you know, more remote monitoring, more support support for you know all kinds of of, of IoT and and remote work environments, whether it's you know lab testing or you know data analysis or contact tracing. I mean, there's just so many different use cases. I want to ask you about Ansible and Red Hat. Obviously, you've been following Ansible since the acquisition by Red Hat. Uh, how do you think they're doing vis-a-vis uh, -vis the market, their competitors that have also been acquired? What's your take on their performance, their transition, their transformation? Well, you know, this, this infrastructure as code or automation as code uh, market has really matured a lot over the last 10, 10 or more years. And I think the Ansible acquisition was about five years ago now. Uh, you know, I think we've moved from just focusing on trying to build elegant automation languages, uh, which certainly was an early initiative. You know, Ansible uh, offered one of the earlier uh, human readable Python based um, approaches as opposed to, you know, more um, challenging programming languages that some of the earlier solutions had. Um, but I think what's been really interesting to me over the last couple of years with, with Red Hat is just what a great job they've done in promoting the community and, and building out that ecosystem. Because at the end of the day, the, the, the value of any of these infrastructure as code solutions is how much they promote the connectivity across networks, clouds, servers, security uh, and and do that in a consistent scalable way and and I think that um, you know that's what really is Matt is going to matter going forward and and that's probably why you've seen a, a, a range of acquisitions in this market uh, over the last couple of years is that as a standalone entity it's hard to build those really robust ecosystems um, and to and to do the analytics and the curation and the support at large scale. So it kind of makes sense as these things mature that they become, find homes you know, with, with larger organizations that can put all that value around it. That's great commentary on the infrastructure as code, totally agree. Um, you, know, you can't go wrong by building abstraction layers and making things more agile. I want to get your take on some announcements that are going on here and, um, and get your thoughts on um, your perspective. Obviously the release of the private automation hub, um, and a bunch of other great stuff. I mean, bringing you know automation, Kubernetes, and a series of new features to the platform together. Obviously, continuation of their mission. Uh, but one of the things when I talk to the engineers is I say, what's the top three things uh, Ansible Fest? And they go, collections, collections, collections. So you start <laughs> to see this um, this this movement around collections um, and the platform. Um, the other theme is you know it's a tool market, and everyone's got tools. We need a platform, so it's the classic tools. We saw that in big data and other areas where you, know, you start getting into platform, you need management, you need orchestration, you need automation, services. Um, what's your uh, perspective on these announcements? Uh, they've been in investing aggressively. Um, what does it mean? What's your take on what does it mean? Well, yeah, I, mean, I, would, I would agree that Red Hat has continued to invest very aggressively in, in Red Hat and in, in um, Ansible over the, the last few years. Uh, what's really interesting is if you go back a couple years, we had Ansible Engine, uh, which included, you know, periodic, um, you know, maybe every quarter or even, you know, every, you know, longer than that, distributions that, that pretty much all Ansible code got shipped on. And then we had Tower, which provided a, uh, an API and, and a way to do some audit and logging and integration with source control. And that was great, but it didn't move fast enough. Uh, and we just got done talking about how you know, everything's accelerated and everything's now connected clouds. And, and I think a lot of what uh, Red Hat's done is really uh, you know, approach the architecture uh, for scale and the ecosystem for scale. And so the, the collections have been really important because they provide a framework to not only validate and curate content, but also to help customers navigate it and find, you know, kind of quickly find the best content for their use cases and also for the partners to engage. Uh, you know, there, there's, there's, you know, a lot, of, I think it's 50 plus collections now that are focused on partner content. And, and so it's, it's it, I think it's really provided a, an environment where the ecosystem can grow where customers can get the support that they need. And then um, you know, with the automation hub and the ability to support really robust source control, 
and distribution. And again, it's promoting this idea of an automation environment that can scale not only within a data center, but really across these connected environments. Great, great stuff. I want to get your uh, thoughts because I want to um, define and understand um, what Red Hat and Ansible, when they talk about curated content, which includes support for OpenShift, um, you know, versus pulling content yeah. from the community. Um, I hear content, I'm like, oh, content, is that a video? Is that, like, <laughs> what is content? So can you explain what they mean when they say they're currently building out, aggressively building out curated content? Um, this idea of what, sure. what does content mean? Is it content, is it code? Sure. And, and yeah, I think, you know, any of these, these automation is code environments, um, you really have a set of build blocks that uh, in the, the Ansible framework would be, be modules and playbooks and roles. And, and those are relatively small, stable, you know, pieces of code. Much of it is actually written by third parties or folks in the community to do a very specific task. And then what, what the Ansible uh, platform is really great at is, is integrating those modules and playbooks and roles to create uh, you know, much more robust automations and to give folks a starting point um, and, and ability to do, rather than having to code everything from scratch, to really kind of pull together things that have been validated, have been tested, you know, get security updates when they need it, that kind of thing. And so the, the customers can focus on essentially chaining these things together and, and customizing them for their own environment as opposed to um, you know, having to write all the code from, from step one. So content means what in this context? What does content mean for them? Uh, it's automation building blocks. It's, it's, it's code. code. It, 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 it's, it's small amounts of code that do very specific things okay. <laughs> that, and, and, you know, in a collections environment, it's, it's, you know, it, it, yeah. it's tagged, it's tested, it's supported. Yeah. Um, and so if there's- it's not a research uh, report code, or a cube video, it's real, it's like code, it's not content. <laughs> It's really right, I know. <laughs> okay, just but the, the, I mean, again, this is automation as code, right? Yeah. So it, 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 it's pieces of code yeah. that rather than uh, needing an, an expert uh, who understands everything about how a particular device or system works, yeah. you've got reusable pieces of code yeah. that can be uh, integrated together uh, customized and run on a repeatable, scalable basis. And if they need to be updated because an API changes or something, the, you know, there's a, there's a chain that goes back to the, uh, the vendors who, you know, again, are part of the ecosystem. And then there's a validation and testing so that by the time it goes back into the collections, uh, the customers can have some confidence that when they pull it down, it's not going to break their whole environment. Whereas in a you know pure community supported model, you have you know the, the 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 content submitted by the community may be beautiful, but you don't know. Yeah. And you could have five submissions that kind of do the same thing. How do you know what's going to work and what's going to be stable? So so it's a lot of of helping organizations you know get automation faster in a more stable environment. Well, we can certainly follow up on this trend because one of the things I've been digging into is this idea of you know, open source and contribution integrations are huge. You know, the collections to me is, is super important because when we start thinking about integration, that's one of cloud native's uh, supposable strengths is to be horizontally scalable, integrate, build these abstraction layers as you had pointed out. Um, so I got to ask you uh, with respect to open source, I was just talking with a bunch of founders yesterday here in Silicon Valley around, you know, as cloud scales and certainly seeing, you know, Snowflake build on top of AWS. I mean, that's an amazing success story. You're starting to see these new innovations where the cloud scale providers are providing great value propositions and the role open source, you know, it's trying to keep pace. And so I got to ask you still open source, I mean, I believe it's important, but how does open source maintain its relevance as cloud scale goes on? Because that's going to force automation to go faster. Okay. And you got the major cloud vendors promoting their own cloud platforms. Yet you got the innovation of startups and companies. You know, enterprises are starting to act like startups as, as container starts to get through this lift and shift phase you'll see innovation coming from enterprises as well as startups. So you start to see this notion right. of there's real value on top of these clouds. What's your take on all of this? Well, I, I, I think open source and, and the communities continue to be very, very important, particularly at the infrastructure layer, because to get all this innovation that you're talking about, 
you act if you believe you've got a connected environment where folks are going to have different footprints and and probably you know more than one public cloud set of resources it's only going to the the value is only going to be delivered if uh the workloads are portable uh they're stable uh they can be integrated they can be secured so i think that uh the open source communities have become you know continue to be an, an incredibly important as a way to get industry alignment and shared innovation uh, on the on the platform and infrastructure and operational levels, um, and I think that that's you know going to be be something that we're going to see for a long time. Well, Mary, I really appreciate your insights. Got one final question, but I'll just give you a plug for the folks watching. Uh, check out Mary's work at IDC. Really cutting edge and super important as cloud management really is at the heart of all the, whether it's multi-cloud, on-premise hybrid or full cloud lift and shift or cloud native, management plays a huge important role right now. That's where the action is. You look at the container growth, as Mary, you pointed out, it's great. So I have to ask you, what comes next? What do you think management will do relative to cloud management as it evolves in these priority environments around cloud, around on-premise, as the operations start to move along, containers are critical. You talked about the growth is only five, 10%, a lot of headroom there. How is management going to evolve? Well, again, I think a lot of it is going to be is everything has to move faster. And that means that automation actually becomes more and more important, but we're going to have to move from automation at human speed to automation at, at, at container and cloud speed. And, and that means a lot of it is going to have to be driven by AI and ML analytics that can, uh, and, and observability solutions. So I think that that's going to be the next wave is taking these, uh, you know, very diverse sources of, of log and metrics and application traces and performance and end user experience and all these different things that tell us how is the application actually running and how is the infrastructure behaving and then putting together uh, an analytics and automation layer that can be a very autonomous. We've at, at IDC been doing a lot of research on the future of digital infrastructure. And this is a, a really fundamental tenet of what we believe is that autonomous operations is the future for, for uh, cloud and IT. Final point for our friends out there and your friends out there watching uh, who uh, some are on the cutting edge, riding the big wave of cloud native. They're at KubeCon, they're digging in, they're in service meshes, Kubernetes containers, you name it. And for the folks who have just been kind of grinding it out in IT operations, holding down the fort, running the networks, running all the apps. What advice do you give the IT skill set friends out there that are watching? What's, what, what should they be doing? What's your advice to them, Mary? Well, you know, we're going to continue to see the convergence of, of virtualized and container-based infrastructure operations. So I think anyone out there that is in those sorts of roles really needs to be getting comfortable with programmatic, code-driven automation and, and uh, figuring out how to think about operations from more of a policy and scale, scalability point of view. Uh, increasingly, you know, if you believe what I just said about the role of analytics uh, driving automation, it's going to have to be based on something, right? There are going to have to be rules, there's going to have to be policies, there's going to have to be, uh, you know, configuration standards. And so kind of making that shift to not thinking so much about, you know, the one-off lovingly handcrafted, handcrafted uh, environment, you're thinking about how do we scale, how do we program it, uh, and starting to get comfort with with some of these tools, like like, like an Ansible, which is you know designed to be uh, pretty accessible by uh, folks with a large range of skill sets. It's human readable. It's Python based. You don't have to be a you know computer science major to be able to get started with it. So I think that that's what many uh, folks have to do is start to think about expanding their skill sets to uh, operate at even uh, greater scale and speed. Mary, thanks so much for your time. Mary Johnston Turner, Vice President of Research at Cloud, for Cloud Management at IDC for the Ansible Fest Virtual. I'm John Furrier with theCUBE for CUBE coverage, CUBE virtual coverage of Ansible Fest 2020 uh, Virtual. Thanks for watching.